Life and death. Life will have no meaning without South Sydney. South is not just a football site, that's our family. I want my son to play for South. We believe we've got causes to appeal and we're going to go ahead with it. We haven't got our fingers crossed and um, you know, I really think the league needs us. It was way back in 1925 at this ground that the famous sporting writer Claude Corbett, who just happens to be my grandfather, described South Sydney as the pride of the league. That was right then, and many believe will be again. Peter Harvey, National 9 News. We all signed a jersey that morning before we left for court. George brought it in. And uh, we said, this is the moment. Either we're burying this jersey today, or it's the beginning of a new era, and we all signed. I'll show it to you. It's either the last South Sydney jersey, or it's the jersey that will symbolise our victory in the courts and our readmission into the competition. Signed by George and the board at the time, Brandon Punter, the then CEO. I'm over there, and the rest speak for themselves. But uh, some very fine people who gave, gave a lot to the club were on that jersey. And, it now symbolises for me our fight back. During the court case, all we really wanted was a win on, on the ladder of appeals. and So we lost the injunction, we lost the main trial. We just knew we had to win at one step, any of those steps. As soon as we won on any step of the process, we knew there'd be such an explosion of sentiment outside, they'd have no choice but to say, come back. So we just needed one win somewhere because the court of public opinion would then judge them for what they'd done. And they were scared about that. The whole legal team, from Tom Hughes to Richard White to Michael Shai, Alison Schiff, the whole team has been encouraged, fortified, and I must say, heartened by the support you've all shown and the undying commitment that you've displayed towards this club. So keep it going and we'll, we'll get there now. South's President George Piggins intends to continue his fight against the NRL and News Limited. And then you subpoena them, and then you get them to open the books, and you see who's been fair dinkum. One of the most famous clubs of all, South Sydney. 20 premierships in a battle for survival. We're not going to go on. We're going to ride the storm and we're going to stick at it. I'll talk to you later. Is it urgent? Urgent? I didn't want to go to uni, and my dad said, we'll go out and get a job. Myself and a friend went into town to uh, get a job at the exchange, what they call chalkies, writing up share prices on the board. And uh, we were passing Australian Consolidated Press, which was Sir Frank Packer's media empire in town. And we stopped and looked and saw some signs which said Daily Telegraph. And I remembered I'd done a, a vocational guidance exam at school, which said I'd be suited for law or journalism. And I thought to myself, I'm gonna go in and ask for a job. And I did, and I got a job, and that was it. In those days, we worked on typewriters. We smoked cigarettes in the office. Ashtrays were chock-a-block. The reporters had one long desk with all typewriters lined up in different intervals. We didn't have individual offices. And the typewriters were actually chained to a bolt in that table. And you could only move it a, a little distance. And the reason for that was that Sir Frank Packer found out that the journos, when we ran out of money, we were taking the typewriters across the road to the hock shop, getting a couple of bucks, going out that night on the drink, and then coming back the next morning and getting it out of hock when we got our expenses. So when he found that out, he had the typewriters chained to the desk. That was the atmosphere at the time. In 1972, Rupert Murdoch bought the Daily Telegraph from Sir Frank Packer, and then I moved over to New Zealand. It's been 98 or 99, 
I was walking my dog in a park at Coogee and George was walking his dog. I told him I was a journalist and I knew the media very well and if there's anything I could ever do to help, please don't hesitate. Directors and supporters met for more than three hours yesterday, deciding to lodge the appeal to the full bench of the federal court. John Hardigan was a, a great bloke, a terrific journalist. He'd done his cadetship at the same time I had. You know, we'd come through the ranks and I knew John very well and he knew me. And he was appointed CEO of News Limited. And I thought, goodness me, well, you know, that, that's, that's quite amazing. Yeah, he's a fellow I know very, very well. I thought, you know, I should probably go and talk to him and see if we could, you know, work something out. So I rang Dr. Jimmy LaHood. Norm had been in News Corp uh, for many, many years. So this is the irony. This is our guy uh, doing all the stories against News Corp. And he'd been working for them for many, many years. He'd been a crime reporter amongst other things. And he'd worked in a lot of different branches of the media. Sunday mornings we'd walk our dogs at Centennial Park. I'd get there. Norm would be on the phone swearing and cursing and threatening and say, and he'd be talking to some reporter from the telly and say, you write that about us again. <laughs> I know him well. I wonder, you know, if I should go and see him. And Jimmy said, oh, absolutely you should. I said, well, let's check with George first. Normie come out on a limb and uh, he worked against his bosses. George gave it the okay, so I rang John Hardy. I said, Hardo, I said, look, I said, it's Norm Lipson here, mate, can I come and see you about Souths? He said, mate, by all means. So the next day, I went to the News Limited and I went into his office. And he's sitting at the desk and we shook hands and a bit of small talk, how have you been, you know, what have you been up to? I said, you know what I've been up to, mate, you know, I've been fighting you guys for, for Souths. I said, look, would you be prepared to meet George Piggins? He just looked at me, he put his hands on his desk, I'll never forget this, and he stood up and he said, Norm, I would go to the Cauliflower Hotel to meet George Piggins. The Cauliflower Hotel was the, the pub that the, all the old South players used to go to after training in the old days. You know, that was the lion's den as far as he was concerned. I said, mate, you don't have to go to the Cauliflower Hotel. Come to George's place. He came here. Norm, he said, I'm bringing John Hardigan to your house. Oh my God, he said, no, I want him to meet George so that he knows what he's up against. John Hardigan, true to his word, comes to George's place, I'm there, George is there, Nolan, she gives us a cup of tea and biscuits. He was here a long time. I made them coffee and I haven't made you coffee, do you want a cup of coffee? I said, George, mate of mine, John Hardigan, he's a decent bloke, a real good bloke. John, this is George Piggins. He's a decent bloke and a real good bloke. They shook hands, everything was cool. John Hardigan said, look, George, would you ever consider merging with Cronulla? I will not be a part of a merger. Like, I, I, I don't care what they offer. Fair enough, he accepted that. He said, I understand. There was mutual respect. When John Hardigan got up to leave, he said, look, it's a pleasure to meet you and we'll resolve this one way or another. And George said, great, it was a pleasure to meet you and let's stay in touch. incredibly courageous and loyal football fans and members who we believe are the greatest in the world. Yeah. Another four in group that brought together media personalities, politicians with the local Test, test one, test one, two, one, two, one, two. South had been to court twice. We lost an injunction to stop News Limited from kicking us out. We could do nothing less but to take this to the highest court in the land. We lost a trial. We believe we got avenues for an appeal. I remember George saying, well, if one judge has gone against us, let's appeal. Maybe three judges will see it our way. Look, maybe with three judges, maybe with three judges, we're a better chance. This was only a hope, really. Fighting Murdoch and fighting the, the, the high, high court, I think it was at that stage. Very rarely win those ones. We always thought we were a good chance of winning, but I, I think deep down inside you were saying to yourself, well, you know, what able we got against these guys? I've got to stay positive here, but it's not looking real good. After a year, year and a half goes by, I didn't think, you know, we'd, 
would stand a chance. And I just thought that was going for good. It's not out of the face, we fired I'd already resigned at that stage, just prior to the third court case. I had some personal matters that I had to deal with. And I suppose now, on reflection, I was just exhausted, man. In a managing sense, that's the three toughest years of my life. In the height of the court cases, we're having board meetings twice a week. I mean, it was, and so much information, twice a week, you know, bang, 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 bang. And deputy chairman, sometimes you've got to take a little bit of a, the fire to deflect a little bit away from George or whatever. And I was totally exhausted and had some other issues in my life that I had to deal with. I was having an each way bet. I wasn't quite sure where they'd get back. Oh my God, that day, the appeal day, wow. Chairman, we'll be passing to seven reporter Chris Reason, who is at the Federal Court in Sydney for the final ruling. What will be going out to the club? I wanted to go and film inside the court when George Piggins was uh, the decisions. Everyone, the, the whole of Australia was waiting for this decision. Saw them all there walking in, and I decided to go in, and I got stopped because I had a camera in my hand, and, they, and the security guard, no, no video cameras, no still shots in the court. I said, okay, no worries, mate. So I went outside. Thought, oh, Jesus. And then I thought, hang on, I'll put my camera in my bag, I'll go in court like nothing, and I'll just turn it on. So I did, went in court, put my bag there, and I looked like that. Oh yes, it's recording, beautiful. I'm sitting there like this, 10, five, 10 minutes, and then I look to the right and I see the security guard and he's, he's gonna be, come here. And I ignored him, <laughs> ignored him and ignored him. And then when I looked over a couple of minutes later, there was police and security, and I thought, as soon as I walked out, they were all waiting for me. They took me in a room. They said, we're gonna find you, we're gonna charge you and this sort of stuff, we're gonna take your camera. I said, you can't take my camera. I said, you can find me, you can do whatever you want. I said, look, guys, why don't we just swap? Look, why don't I just give you the tape and I won't have any footage? And I convinced them, why can't you film in court? It wasn't a murder. It was no one got murdered or it wasn't a, something bad. Speak to a lawyer. Speak to Pappas. We'd been to Nick Pappas's office in the morning before the court case, and we all marched up there together. The last day we did it, when we went up for the judgment in the full court, it became this throng of people all walking up together from the bunker up to the court. It wasn't a matter of, I'll be heartbroken if we don't get in. I will be, but as far as I'm concerned, well, rugby league will be something I used to follow. I don't know whether it was just pig-headedness, but you always, it wasn't just hope that kept people going. We knew we were right. I was actually not able to be in the court that day because of, I had media commitments, but I was uh, following it very, very closely. Because the first court case hadn't gone as we'd hoped, and because the law is the law, it's very arcane, it's, it's difficult to understand. <laughs> it was a Trade Practices Act. I don't know about you, but I don't spend a lot of time reading Trade Practices Law, so it was nerve-wracking, but I, I do remember thinking that We've already won. One of them was on video link, and one said, I would refuse the appeal. Justice Moore said I would allow the appeal. Then it came down to the guy who was on the screen from Melbourne, Justice Merkel. We were all focused on the screen. We had a live telecast straight outside the court. Did you hear it? Old phones. You hear, hello? I too would allow the appeal. We didn't want to leave. We didn't want to leave the club. I mean, they had to kick us out. They had to close. We didn't want to leave. We didn't want to leave. That was a, one of the happiest days of my life, man. It had to be the happiest day of my life. I was driving somewhere and I immediately turned around and went to the club to, just to see what was going to happen. And it was absolutely packed. They were crying and doing all sorts of things. You could see the look on their faces that they'd regained something in their lives that we'd been taken away from them. A young lad had cut his, uh, had, had suffered a laceration, I was stitching him at the surgery. 
and my secretary said, you want to take this call? So she held the phone up to my ear and screaming on the other side were all the boys in the courtroom saying, we've won, we've won, we've won. So my hands started trembling <laughs> uh, in a way you can't imagine. And the uh, poor boy's mother's looking at me wondering what the hell's happened. I said to her, look, I'm just going to have to stop for a minute or two <laughs> before I can finish this. I think I walked out the front of the surgery and just screamed at the top of my voice, yay. One of the QCs who was representing one of the clubs, and I'm not mentioning any names, I went to school with. And after we were reinstated, he came up to me and he said, that was the hardest task I've had in my legal career because I've loved South since I was a little kid. And I said, well, there you go. You chose to be a QC and a lawyer. That's your problem. <laughs> I wanted to be the first to capture George coming out and uh, the crew coming out of the car. And as soon as I got downstairs, I saw Jerry Lissing and I said, Jerry. Is George coming soon? Is, is he coming soon? Oh, you beauty. Couldn't wait. And then all of a sudden I see this long stretch limo, white limo, and another one behind us. I said, that's them. Bang, I ran straight. The door opens. I get George. There he is there. Discussions with the NRL is George for president. From, uh, <laughs> when we came out of court and we got our heads together, there was myself, George, Jimmy, and Nolan, and Peter Hood. And George's phone went and he answered it, and it was John Hardigan. And John Hardigan said to George, Congratulations on the win, George, and welcome back to the NRL. It's just great for the people of South Sydney and well done, people of Australia who, who have supported us all along and, and never give up hope and we've got the result we deserve, don't we? Well done, Tony, Tony. Go back to the club, it was, it was fantastic. It was a whole lot, lot different from the time we got, we got thrown out. All the same people who had tears running down their cheeks you know, a year earlier. I just thought that we were, in, we were right and we were wrongly done by and we were going to fight till we got justice and uh, we got justice here today. George stood up because we we were entitled to have a team to, to support. It's been here since 1908. Now all these people in the flats around here, that's all they have is their football team and um, that's who we fought for. It was absolute pandemonium and we went back to Nick's office. There's cameras following the, everyone on the streets out the front of the court. There's people crying in the, again in the streets. We all went to a coffee shop opposite Nick's office to, to take a breath and decide on what our next uh, movements were, which was obviously to go back to the club and have a press conference. The list of individual people who were stuck with this club through its most harrowing period in its 90 year existence is monumental. To try and name every person would probably take a day and a half and ultimately we would not forgive ourselves if we missed thanking any one of these people. It was a very emotional day and it's a day I'll never ever forget. Nicholas Pappas, our legal New Zealand CEO, Mr John Hardigan said today the company accepted the court's decision and hoped the NRL and South Sydney would begin immediate discussions regarding the club's participation in the 2002 competition. We had to wait for the third judge to speak because when we heard the first judge, we thought, oh, we're gone. We had some leaks out of the court that we were home. I think that uh, they've got some hope, the Rabbitohs fans. I think that they've fought a long, hard and a good fight. My son was interviewed by Channel 9. He came with his mother just to watch. He couldn't get, they couldn't get into the courtroom, so they were waiting outside. I'm going to go for them and my children and my children's children. <laughs> Went home that night. He was waiting at the top of the stairs and he said, we're going to the footy. We're going to the footy, Dad. Today, appropriately, it was time to say, hail to the chief. Of course, I wasn't on the board then. I sort of thought it was not inappropriate, but I just wanted to be 
away. I could have gone to the Lees Club and a big crowd there, but I was actually at home and watched it on TV. Oh yeah, I jumped in the air. That was another moment. I think in 2014, it made it all worthwhile to me. But that moment was, oh mate, look to see, to see supporters of our club just crying and running around Redfin or wherever you, you were in the South Sydney area, just momentous joy. And we fought the good fight and we won. And I think there was a couple of aspects to that. It was wonderful for the club and the supporters to get re-entry into the competition. It also told people that people power is really strong and it doesn't matter how big the big end of town is, well, we took them on and we won. And that was so satisfying for a lot of people. And this is with all due respect to News Limited and, and Channel 9, we're all friends now. You know, we're all in the rugby league and it's on Fox and it's on there. It's all friends now, 20 years down the track. Back then it was bitter. It was really bitter and really tough. And for working class people and a working class club to get one up on the big end of town, that was just, to me, I was so stoked we were back in the competition or we'd won that court case. Two judges to one. But it was the fact that we took on the big boys and we beat them. And I don't think that had ever happened before in this country. And to fight on in those circumstances speaks uh, volumes for the passion and loyalty they and their members feel about their place in the history of rugby league. We were a little tiny mouse running around an arena with two massive elephants and we dodged it and we weaved and people come on board and, and, and gave us their expertise for nothing, nothing. People didn't ask for anything. They just wanted to help, help and help and help. So on a day like that, when you get the tick and you're back in, all of those emotions ran through me. I cried, I rang a few people. Can't remember who I rang actually. Probably my mum and my sister, because diehards and they've been very supportive of me being on the board as well but a full gamut of emotions in my lounge room at home on my own the same thing happened when we won the 2014 grand final i couldn't get to the game and i got home halfway during the first half so i sat and watched that grand final on my own in my lounge room same thing when the siren went at the end just those moments where there's like energy coming out of the end of your fingertips. <sighs> We've done it. There are two moments in my life I'll never forget. The day we won the court case, the day we won in 2020. Now mind you, those grand finals at the back end of the 60s into the 70s, I went to three of those with my dad. I'll never forget them either. One of them was when we lost to Balmain. I cried all the way from the SCG to Matraville. You'd be goddamn with your but, but they were inspirations. Three cheers for George. <laughs> <laughs> Both those moments I felt like that and cried with emotion and outlet of emotion. And it's all worth it then. It was all worth it from day one. George was extremely important, but without Ray Martin, Mike Whitney, Mikey Robbins, Andrew Denton, and all the others, it wouldn't have happened. It was a nice mix. We had a nice blend of media. And that went back to South's great success in the 60s and 70s. We are the products of that period. Thankfully, we were able to make a contribution back to the club that had given us so much. It was like um, one of the great days of our lives, the great days of anyone's life, I think, to, uh, to finally have a victory against the odds. Again, I'm, it wasn't George's day, it wasn't Nick Pappas' day, it was the South supporters' day. Um, but suddenly they've beaten uh, big guys, suddenly they've beaten the odds and, uh, and we were back in the game. There's a photo of me, I lost it years ago. When the afternoon edition of the newspaper came in on the day we got back, at the club, probably had a few, standing on a table holding the, <laughs> the newspaper over my head, 
which was not a good idea because I was about 140 kilos at the time. I don't think a, uh, a Lee's Club table ever worked harder. Before I open to questions, one expect to see if we've been in battle with sections of the media. Our case would not have been won if it were not for the support of many other media organisations. Yeah. We didn't just see a story, they saw the right in the story. So thank you for your support of this case. My feeling is, had South lost that court case, the NRL would have extended an olive branch because it was too ugly at that point. And, you know, you've seen the media coverage of, on that day and around that time. It was wall to wall and none of it was going, yes, these people should be kicked out. All of it was, what the hell? This needs to be uh, addressed. It needs to be corrected. Rugby League started with South and it will end with South. <laughs> Never say die. Actually, I remember where I was when we found out we were coming back into the competition. I just remember being at home and seeing the, the news come up, flash up, pop up, and that was just a overwhelming relief just to know that, oh, yes, there's somewhere you can strive to go after being SG Ball, Howard Matthews coming through the junior ranks, and it was a big relief. Now a dream come true for, especially for me, I know that. For me as a player, I thought it was great, but in my mind, I was a rooster at that point in time. I actually had a clause in my contract that would enable me to go back to Souths if Souths got back into the competition within those three years, which unfortunately they didn't. But um, the roosters, they were, they were said, yep, that's, that's no problem at all. Reality of the situation was though, I never got asked. I never got asked to come back. They're my club, they were my home. It's the club that I wanted to play for and only ever wanted to play for and they were back. It was just amazing. And I was driving to Newcastle Stadium, whatever it was called back then, and uh, I was driving with Andrew Voss because I was doing commentary with him for, which was the Kellogg's Nutrigrain Cup at the time, the schoolboy competition, and we're driving up there and I come across the radio that South was back in the competition and Andrew Voss broke down and cried while he was driving and had to keep wiping his eyes and I said, Vossie, what? Why, why are you so emotional? He goes, I don't say this much, I don't put it out there. I'm a massive Rabbitohs supporter, you know, always have been. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a member. And we kept driving, he was crying and I was crying. And he was wiping his eyes and I was wiping my eyes. And it, it resonates with me even now, you know, that um, it touched people to that level. It got them right to, the, to their heart, you know, and, and he had young boys. And for him to be able to know that his young fella can support the club that he supported growing up. It, it's, it's a massive thing in a family, you know, and as we all know, you know, rugby league is, is tribal in Australia. You pass it down, you don't have a choice who you support, you know, and, and that's the way it generally goes. And as it was passed down to me from my grandfather to my father to myself. <laughs> We had a game the next day uh, up at the Central Coast. We went ahead with that and um, it was fantastic. Guys, right, on behalf of the club, once again, thank you very much for all your hearts in the previous games. The previous games have been fighting the battle. After yesterday, you know we're there. So now you're starting for the New South Sydney. So good luck, enjoy yourselves. It's been great to have your help and you'll always, it's a pretty historic moment because you can see the people out here, they love this club and they love you guys. Thanks very much again. Thank you very much. You look back at that, I mean, the best thing we could say is, hey, we're out there playing. That's the reward. That's the reward for following our club. And you can't buy that. You can't sell it. <laughs> that feeling is just fantastic. And uh, that's why it's great to be a South supporter. <laughs> South Sydney till I die is more than a slogan, that's for sure. It's a way of life. <laughs> when South came back in, the competition was complete again with one of the original clubs, the, the first premiership, 1908. You can't not show respect to those clubs. Any of those clubs are really early members of the, of the NRL or the New South Wales Rugby League. Or something. <laughs> George doesn't show emotion. He takes it all as it comes. If he does, he doesn't he doesn't talk about it. He might get a bit edgy. Everyone who supported the cause was as important as the other. Whether you were a club president, whether you're a board member, whether you were 
someone from the community, whether you are a, a worker in the area, everyone pulled together. It was a magnificent show of strength, unity and solidarity. And it prevailed. Thank God. Here they go. Yeah, we're all there. Today, the court ruled the 14-team competition breached the Trade Practices Act by excluding particular clubs like Salem. So we get readmitted. David Moffat saying they've put up a good fight. We invite them to come and make an application. We made the application in about five minutes. Then News said to us, News invited me in. It said, all good, peace in our time. You're going to compete next year, but we're taking this to an appeal. We don't want this judgment that we have engaged in unlawful conduct, we don't want it to remain. We want you to fight as hard as you can against us, and we're gonna fight as hard to get this eradicated, but you're in. Who pays my cost? We couldn't have afforded to pay for that. We'll pay your cost. So I charged, I charged well. Could you imagine if they had said after all that, no, nah, we're not gonna readmit them? They would have lost everybody. Everybody would have walked away from the game because that would have been a ridiculous decision. It's to the benefit of News Limited that South Bank has been for a long time. It generated enormous interest. They win either way, and that's fine. If you were to do a cost-benefit analysis of kicking South out, you would go, that was a really dumb business decision. Let's never do anything as dumb as that again. They're unlikely to ever engage in the sort of chicanery that was involved here. To take over a sport, to expel a foundation club, force it to amalgamate as they attempted um, really was a total and utter abuse of power. The journalists knew it was management who were locked into the commercial objectives of News Limited who ran this fight and today the coverage from News Limited is a lot better for our club. All this garbage that was going on with about Super League that Rubo was saying that players could walk down the streets of Russia or China and they'd be recognised, you know, as rugby league players we've got to send the game global, but a load of garbage, mate. And that turned out to be that way too. We were in this incongruous position where we were back in the competition and I had to fight a court case to defend the decision of the, of the full bench against the creme de la creme of the legal community at the time. And they were paying my cost. And I've still got the checks photocopied from New Zealand for the fees, paying every month for me to fight them. News Limited had a, one more right of appeal, which they did appeal, to the High Court. And they ended up winning that High Court appeal. People think South's won in the courts. We lost in the courts. We won in the People's Court. That was the day that made South Sydney a force. And this is the answer to those people who said that. Look around you. Now, if you don't return what belongs to the people, then you'll have to live with the consequences. And I promise you, until you people walk away, I won't. I'll stay and fight. When South came back in, I thought that I would get us, but I didn't. Any other player that left us under those circumstances, the players to look out for yourself, and uh, we only wish all players that have signed the other clubs all the best. But uh, we'll start from scratch and then we'll start from scratch. And I remember George Piggins saying in the media that we'd never pay more than $200,000 for a uh, for any player. There wouldn't have been a player in the Australian team getting paid less than $200,000. The thing that I always thought was, was strange looking from then an outsider was that board, minus me at the end, with George as the chairman, got us through the court cases, got us all the sponsorship to get back, got us in the position that we were to re-enter the competition, which we did. And very quickly, all of those board members were gone.
Oh, it was, it was a massive build up because you know the, the, the media who wanted us out were back on our side because they could sell on papers again. <laughs> and um, so it was all, all South Sydney. But... It was weird when we came back. It was weird to think we're back in the game. We're back in the, in the game we loved. And the atmosphere, you'd have sworn we were the favourites to win the Premiership. I was the only player to play the last game and the first game back, which was, it was sad in one way, but it was amazing in another. You know, you, what, what happened that Roosters game will never happen again prior. You're up against your old club tonight, the Rabbitohs. Is this the sort of match you wanted to get out of the way? Every time I played for the Roosters against the Rabbitohs or the Rabbitohs against the Roosters, it was always a super special game for me. And they're able to score, Craig Wing. I thought it was pretty cool that the Rabbitohs were back in the comp. We didn't have the talents to really be a competitor. It's been a long time and we're back again and they deserve to be there. It's the best thing, we've got our life back again. People had this big expectation we we're going to make the semi-finals and um, it was never going to happen. No better for Number one, Bunnies, we're back. The curtain goes up on 2002. It was always going to be huge. Yeah, Wooshka is here, they first.